great to be here. I don't have a PowerPoint because I didn't have any Winnie the Pooh pictures on my computer. <laughs> Joel provided me this as my, as my graphic. Uh, these, are my, these are my lecture points, but they're in hieroglyphics, so you won't be able to understand them. Sorry about that. My title, by the way, is slightly amended. It's Prefiguration rather than Prophecy. Apocalypse, tragedy, three trajectories rather than dimensions of patristic interpretation of the Adamic fall. In 1974, armed with the documentary hypothesis and extensive knowledge of the religious myths of the ancient Near East, Klaus Westermann declared that there was no grand fall in, of humankind in Genesis 3, a doctrine he called further inaccurate and even deceptive. He spoke for numerous modern critical interpreters of Genesis convinced that the fall is merely an imaginative contrivance of Christian theology. And certain theolo Christian theologians of late have conceded this point. For instance, the ecological theologian Christopher Southgate, noting that death, suffering, and disruption were already well underway in the evolutionary process of the natural world before hominids came along to instigate them, deems the fall untenable for Christians. John Polkinghorne has called it the hardest classical Christian doctrine to reconcile with evolutionary science. And yet, unlike Southgate, Polkinghorne is not quite ready to say or to lay the, the, the fall to rest. And he remains um, keen, really, to preserve its mythos, namely as reflecting how humans evolved to the point of moral self-consciousness and an awareness of creaturely mortality and decay putatively the kind of death that Paul accredits to Adam in Romans 5. Celia Dean Drummond is another good example of a contemporary theologian committed to the canons of modern biology and physics who rehabilitates the mythos of the fall without treating it as history pure and simple. For her, the fall in Genesis 3 epitomizes an irrevocable crossroads in the evolution of morality, not only among humans but in the whole animal creation. I mentioned the likes of Polkinghorn and Dean Drummond in order to suggest that despite obvious disparities of context and scientific development, the dilemma of early Christian interpreters was not so radically different. Often ignored by modern biblical critics either as naive literalists or fanciful allegorists locked into a thoroughly ahistorical hermeneutic, Patristic exegetes, while presupposing that Genesis 3 narrated a, a catastrophic fall, were hardly unanimous on its precise circumstances or repercussions. Even they recognized that the narrative sent mixed signals about conditions in the garden, the primary responsibility for the transgression, the anatomy of the sin itself, and God's providence in letting it happen in the first place. Few patristic interpreters, furthermore, took the story as a straightforward explanation or logos of the complicated ancestry of human sin. In this lecture, I wish to track three trajectories in which early Christian expositors reconstructed the mythos, the core story or dramatic plot of the fall. So first, the fall as prefiguration. For numerous patristic expositors, especially but not exclusively in the East, the story in Genesis 3 was less about sin than about sinning, ever-present tense. Less about sin in the abstract than about the concrete habituation and exercise of wickedness. Here questions such as whether Adam was merely an individual person or embodied universal human nature or of the precise etiology of moral evil did not disappear, but they receded into the background. By these kinds of renderings, the fall in Eden was a prefiguration and an omen of the domino effect of transgenerational disobedience. Hermeneutical license for this kind of interpretation lay in the widespread early Christian conviction that Genesis, like all of Hebrew scripture, not just the prophetic books themselves, was intrinsically prophetic and typologically fertile. Adam and Eve were primarily prototypes whose antitypes 
are all of us human beings ever since. I begin here with Origen, though in his attention to the complexity of Adam and the fall, his interpretation is itself quite complex, further complicated by the fact that the relevant section of his huge commentary on Genesis is lost. We presume that Adam fit into Origen's controversial scheme of a double fall. First, when, along with all rational beings, except the soul of Jesus, he fell by negligence from prehistoric union with God and was degraded into a body fitting the moral degree of his lapse. And then second, when the historical Adam, thus embodied, began leading his posterity astray into vices. The problem is that in his zeal to keep a pace of the allegorical and historical dimensions of the primeval history, and in his patience of multiple valid interpretations of the details of the primeval history, Origen is fuzzy about the earthly paradise and the actual bodily status of Adam and Eve. What is clear, however, is that Origen is preoccupied more with linking Adam and Eve with humanity's present moral condition and the prospects for future perfection than with making clear connections between the different stages of human origins, namely Genesis 1, 26 and 27, the creation of humanity in the image and likeness of God, Genesis 2, 7, the formation of the man of dust, later followed by the woman from his rib in 2.22, and then finally Genesis 3.21, the imposition of the quasi-punitive garments of skins, which has a long exegetical history in the early church. Indeed, Origen, Origen's overriding concern is to portray Adam and Eve as moral and spiritual prototypes. He can speak of Adam both as an individual sinner and as the representative of all humanity, the latter in deference, of course, to Paul's perspective in Romans 5, 12 to 18, where the whole human race is implicated in Adam's transgression. Either way, the existential drama of human self-determination is brought to the forefront. And given Origen's fierce rebuke of Gnostics and Marcionites, matching only Sean McDonough's this morning, there is no hint of ontological determinism. Adam, both enabled and saddled by his soul's union with the earthly body, stands at the threshold of engaging free will in all its earthly concreteness and potential. And right there with him stand all of us, his pupils, as it were, learning how to sin and how to die a spiritual death by imitation of his transgression. Morally speaking, says Origen, Adam murdered his offspring by his bad parental example, a trend further deepened, of course, with Cain. Later disciples of Origen followed suit, especially the fourth century Alexandrian monk Didymus the Blind. For Didymus, Adam and Eve supplied their posterity with the paradigmatic example of cutting off the spiritual senses the lifeline of virtue, thus giving rein to the bodily senses with their propensities to vice. When they heard God walking in the garden, this simply indicated that Adam and Eve had already alienated themselves from God, sensing him at a distance rather than as intimately present, which he is always for the virtuous. And when God asked Adam where he was, he was merely signaling that he was not abandoning him, but ready to make room now for correction and repentance. Given that his primary, primary audience was fellow monks, Didymus's rendering of the fall basically as a failure of asceticism had traction. It was a story, moreover, not just of aborted self-control, but of demonic deception, something with which monks were all too familiar. Although neither Origen nor Didymus allowed that the devil and his legions should be held exclusively accountable for human vice, then or now. 
Didymus saw a comedy of sorts in the shirking of responsibility in the garden. Adam blaming Eve, Eve blaming the serpent. It was an equal opportunity guilt. Eve had been Adam's own pupil in paradise, and he let her down. Though some interpreters, Didymus notes, tried to help Adam save face, suggesting that he coalesced in her bad choice though that, so that she would learn a, punitive, a punitively healthy moral lesson. And, of course, he was following Paul in 1 Timothy 2.14. Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived. Eve, on the other hand, was without excuse in letting herself be duped by the serpent's fraudulent instruction. In the end, Adam and Eve had both become disciples of Satan, imitating his serpentine perversion by deceiving themselves and each other. As Origen puts it, anyone who gravitates to vice over virtue is already a miniature Satan in his or her own right. Subsequent ascetic and monastic interpreters holding to this existential interpretation of the fall concentrated heavily on Adam and Eve's misappropriation of freedom resulting in a moral failure to thrive. The deeply ascetic Syriac fathers, Ephraim, later on Narsai and Jacob of Sarug, pushed the travesty of freedom in paradise to its dramatic hilt. Adam and Eve had everything going for them and blew it. As Ephraim says sarcastically, they were commanded to abstain from one solitary tree, hardly a crushing prohibition. Adam already had regal status in creation. He knew only glory, maturity, no shame. The tempter was a serpent of all things. A a slightly above average dumb animal, no match for an intelligent human being. The performance of Adam and Eve was a farce since they wasted the creaturely freedom that was supposed to be their very path to approaching and appropriating full beatitude. For Ephraim, Adam, and Eve had been created neither mortal nor immortal, but poised to use free will in choosing between the alternatives. Jacob of Sarug ascertained that they were created as a compound of mortality and immortality, but agreed at the end of the day that they had actively to choose between the destinies of death and eternal life. And Narsai argued that they were natural mortals, but similarly concluded still that Adam and Eve had to learn to use their free will prudently. The gist of their collective exposition is clear enough. The first form humans blazed the trail for the rest of us who, generation after generation, stand at the threshold of learning true freedom. Whereas the Syriac writers tended to describe free will as a natural human potentiality, the British monk Pelagius, yes, that Pelagius, emphasized it as the quintessential created grace. Taking his cues from Paul's depiction of Adam's sin in Romans 5 and Origen's commentary on the passage in Rufinus of Aquileia's Latin translation, which Pelagius was able to read, Pelagius reiterated the idea that Adam's sin was the prototypical abuse of free will, a blatant act of disobedience, pure and simple. Still, however, there was no hereditary guilt passed down, only a bad example that all of us just keep repeating. The grace of free will has been renewed with each individual human being ever since Adam, though coming to fruition, of course, only through imitating Christ and his saints and actively cooperating in one's salvation. So Pelagius' position is really pretty exegetically simple. Besides free will itself, early Christian ascetics who interpreted the fall as a prefiguration or omen also occupied themselves with precisely which passion induced the lapse and came up with diverse candidates. Ephraim, for example, assumed that avarice 
The sheer lust for more lay behind Adam and Eve's seduction. John Chrysostom preached to his morally lethargic audiences that sloth was the catalyst in the protoplast's ill choice. Gregory of Nyssa, among others, asserted that it was the deadly vice of envy, the vice long associated by early Jewish and Christian exegetes with the devil himself, largely because of Wisdom 224. Later on in the East, Maximus the Confessor instead claimed that the mother of all vices was sheer narcissistic self-love, philotia. While in the West, Augustine similarly identified pride, superbia, the hubris of exalting oneself above God as the original vice, both of the devil and of the first human, citing Sirach 10, verse 13. Even though he ultimately tagged the passion of lust, concupiscence, as the viral carrier of the hereditary transmittal transmitted guilt of Adam, that is, original sin. So second, the trajectory of the fall as an apocalypse. A second trajectory of patristic interpretation of the fall focused less on its prototypical or exemplary nature than its place within the creator's providence and revelatory economy, the economia. Here, a rather staggering constellation of theological problems imposed itself on the exegesis of Genesis 3, some of which have come up in this conference. How could a provident God have allowed the fall to happen in the first place? If Adam and Eve were created in a state of original righteousness with unsullied faculties, how could they possibly have chosen against the good? More to the point, Whence arose moral evil out of such an idyllic state? How did the fall impact Adam's posterity ontologically? Obviously, I can only attempt a, a sampling here, a very slim sampling. Early on, Irenaeus of Lyon anticipated some of these questions, and rather than simply putting out theological fires here and there, sought to preempt them by reframing our whole interpretive approach to the fall. Irenaeus, we must remember, was already confronted with Gnostic myths, some of which speculated that the real fall consisted in the alienation from on high of a sub-divine being, Sophia, leading to the creation of the material world by her progeny, a deluded demiurge who didn't know what he was doing. For Irenaeus and his many devotees, this view, which effectively rendered creation contingent on the fall and treated the fall as having caught God off guard, was a total aberration. But on the orthodox side, Irenaeus also resisted simply placing the fall in a tidy chronological sequence of events of the biblical history. First creation itself, then the disruption caused by the fall, then God's interve interventions to redeem the fallen world climaxing, of course, in Christ's advent, and at last the final consummation. Such a reconstruction seemed to render sacred history too much still like a grand emergency effort by God to fix the fall and its effects. Irenaeus instead claimed that, the, that God created the world to be the theater for unveiling his sacrificial love in Jesus Christ, and that Christ's incarnation and passion recapitulated the whole teleology of creation. And of course, he cites there Ephesians 1, verse 10. As Irenaeus puts it, God originally opened the book containing the secrets of creation to none other than the lamb who was to be slain. Or elsewhere, he writes, quote, insofar as he who saves already existed, it was necessary that what would be saved should also come into existence in order that the Savior should not exist in vain, end quote. This statement sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? But it befits Irenaeus' larger schema in which creation is already essentially a revelatory and salvific project from the outset. The cosmos has been created precisely in order to be recreated, 
and transfigured. Even death itself, according to Irenaeus, was in the works before the fall. For rather than being purely punitive, the Creator had already planned it as a vehicle of life. The death of Christ occurred on the sixth day, the same day of the week on which Adam was created, created, quote, thereby granting Adam a second creation by means of his passion, which is a recreation from out of his death, unquote. Accordingly, the Adamic fall was apocalyptic in the sense that even though it frustrated the graciousness of the creator, it signaled a crucial stage in the revelation of Jesus Christ as the new Adam. Rhetorically and dramatically speaking, there is an unmistakable element here of Felix culpa. Since the fall triggered the disclosure of an unprecedented redemptive grace. Just got to get that Latin phrase back out there again. We <laughs> touched on it briefly yesterday. But it was also couched in Irenaeus's strongly providentialist perspective, wherein the Creator fully foreknew the fall and accommodated it in his larger work of training humanity, exercise its freedom wisely, and mature toward the cruciform image of Jesus Christ. Irenaeus's legacy for later patristic interpreters was enormous especially in the Greek tradition, where his vision of the seamless interconnection between creation and redemption found new expression in Athanasius, the Cappadocian fathers, and especially in the early Byzantine theologian Maximus the Confessor. Maximus, too, presumed that the creator's show of self-sacrificial grace in the incarnation and passion of Jesus Christ was creation's very purpose even before the foundation of the world. In Maximus's judgment, Adam fell, quote-unquote, at the instant he was created, squandering his freedom and the potential for uninterrupted spiritual pleasure. And so, like Irenaeus, Maximus avoids dwelling on pre- and post-lapsarian phases of human existence. The history of Adam's descendants has never been other than a history of redemption and recreation a work always in forward progress, eschatologically speaking, rather than a work of, of recovering or reduplicating paradise loss. I like, I like uh, Hans Urs von Balzar's image in his book on Maximus, where he says, for Maximus, the doors of paradise have been remorselessly shut for the human race. We can't go back. We can't go back. Only the cross, only the cross, which some patristic exegetes identify, of course, as the true tree of life, can make the new creation complete. Within this trajectory of seeing the fall as an apocalypse, concentration on Christ as the revelation and embodiment of the new Adam became the lens through which to investigate the limitations and liabilities of the old Adam. Patristic authors largely treated Paul's Adam-Christ typology both as a positive, insofar as old and new Adam each respectively represented a whole new beginning, but also as negative inasmuch as the new Adam rectified and far outstripped the old. The old Adam, presumably epitomizing fallen human nature as a whole, demanded a case study a case study, as it were, in moral psychology and theological anthropology to determine his precise legacy for the rest of us. Again, the question, how could one created in the image of God also become the source of moral evil in the world? It was insufficient simply to identify his specific original vice as a fait accompli. What was the deeper causal structure of sin operative in Adam that had such disastrous results? And I think Mickey was touching on this in his question and answer time a moment ago. On this point, the two Cappadocian bishops of the fourth century, who were also brothers, Basil of Caesarea and Gregory of Nyssa, provide an interesting contrast. Basil effectively avoids these problems in his homilies on human origins because he fears any implication that Adam's sin represented a genetic or genealogical determinism causing all the rest of us to sin. Gregory of Nyssa, however, explores these problems in detail 
albeit dialectically, since the logic of the Adamic fall is hardly transparent. Gregory is vexed by how Adam can bear human nature as a whole, but also sin as a concrete individual. For in Gregory's own variation on the double creation theory that goes all the way back to Philo, Clement of Alexandria in origin, God in an instantaneous act of his will outside of time and space created universal human nature in his own image, what Gregory calls the pleroma, or fullness of the human race, which was not the unity of pre-existent souls that Origen had talked about, a unity of souls before their degradation into bodies, but the paradigmatic interrelation of intelligible soul and sensible body to be instantiated henceforth in every human being and to serve as the basis of their eschatological perfection and deification. And yet Adam, the actual first human and the first hope for the race in this historical project of, be, of bringing the human pleroma to, to perfection, skewed human nature, tripped it into a fallen state, both by failing in the knowledge of God, or specifically, says Gregory, failing to have, quote, a disposition toward the God who was gracious to him. Unquote. And by turning instead to a mixed knowledge, the knowledge of evil masquerading as a good. Along with the devil, serpent, Adam became the inventor of moral evil, the inventor of moral, moral evil, which has no being, no ontological status in creation apart from deviant human choice. Gregory uses the analogy of a man who deliberately closes his eyes to the healthy light so that the blackness or the de deprivation of light which he sees becomes his fixation, his new normal, even though of course, it's an illusion. You ever noticed that when you close your eyes for a while, you actually see things inside your eyelids, images and all sorts of things? As for how a creature of such promise could make such a bad choice, Gregory, as an ascetical theologian, resorts to the rocky relation between the intelligent soul and the sensate body, the lure of the flesh, the culprit, of course, Though he believes that the garments of skins in Genesis 3.21, which for him signify mortality, susceptibility to carnal passions, and likeness to irrational animals, were largely added to Adam and Eve's bodies after their sin, this consequence seems strangely also to have been the cause of the lapse. Be that as it may, in his providential ordering of things, Gregory aversed that God had outfitted human nature with sexual difference, such as could prospectively be used for sexual procreation once the angelic life of paradise had been lost. But with that came the possibility of humans' abuse of their carnality and their gravitation to the pleasures of the body. The precariousness of the soul-body relation was, pre was present from the very outset of human life on earth. But that same precariousness, what Athanasius calls the liability of humans to lapse into chaos and even into non-existence, was also the raw material of renewal and transformation, a salvific creatio ex nihilo. For Gregory of Nyssa, then, the fall is apocalyptic in revealing the ambiguity of, moral, of mortal human existence. In principle, human nature as such is incapable of failure since it is divinely fashioned and propelled toward, toward its appointed telos. But the notion of human nature, nature, has dexterity for Gregory. Nature does not dwell in sheer abstraction because nature is essence tending toward the fray, as it were, of concrete existence. Providentially and eschatologically speaking, the pleroma of human nature can reach final perfection only through taking on a history with individual agents who in their respective times and places must live into the freedom granted them by the creator. 
if it sounds like there is a built-in necessity here, it is a benevolent necessity on the Creator's part. And indeed, for Gregory, the divine economy in history ends at last with the apocatastasis panton, the restoration of all human beings, the fullness of the pleroma, which is saved and deified, though not in a way for Gregory that overrides the cooperation of free creatures in their restoration, since eschatological beatitude for him is a perpetual striving, a, an epectasis toward the inexhaustible beneficence of God. We're always going to be using our free will in the pursuit of virtue, even in the afterlife. So finally, this brings me to the third trajectory, the fall as a tragedy. I turn to this one because, um, I turn to it last because I've been working on this for the last two years. Um, the fall as a tragedy. This sounds strange because we know that early Christians repudiated the Greco-Roman theater in all of its forms, whether it was the circus and the games and so on, or anything performed on stage. And the Romans loved anything on stage. But it manifested, I think, the patristic exegetical tradition that deployed the mimesis of drama and even of tragedy in expounding particular biblical narratives. So these, these interpreters realized that tragedy was, an, was a, a culturally appropriated tradition that they might still be able to revamp. It was not lost on certain patristic interpreters that the Adamic fall had some of the classic earmarks of tragedy outlined by Aristotle in his poetics, even though they often shied away from making those completely explicit. For example, Aristotle, his term for the so-called tragic flaw of a tragic hero was also the biblical word for sin, or the, in the Greek tradition, hamartia. Classicists note that for Aristotle himself, the term designated less a latent character flaw per se than a disastrous and irrevocable miscalculation having dire repercussions for the unwitting perpetrator and others as well. Christian exegetes were naturally more inclined to play up the conscious wrongdoing and moral culpability of Adam and Eve, such as we saw in the speculations on their original vice or passion. But they also recognized a fateful ignorance on their part. Basil of Caesarea calls it their thoughtlessness, their indecisiveness toward the good with death for all as the tragic price. Two of Aristotle's other defining traits of tragedy were profound reversal of fortune, peripeteia, and the hero's dramatic recognition, or anagnorisis, of his or her grievous blunder. In the Western tradition, Ambrose of Milan, Augustine, and Avitus of Vienne in their various ways, played up these elements. For, for them, the fall unfolded as a tragedy of progressive deception with horrible consequences. The villainous stealth of the envious devil, himself already fallen and telling lies through the serpent with rhetorical skill, set in motion a dark comedy of miscues. For Ambrose, the reversal of fortune was an unraveling of the proper hierarchy of divine human authority and human and communication. Adam, despite his glorious state in Eden, needed the divine commandment because of the intrinsic weakness of his judgment and his inability to manage the knowledge of good and evil. The even weaker woman, not duly informed of God's commandments by her husband and instead ill-formed by the devil, initiated the actual breach, leading to the recognition of that nakedness which was the despoiling of humanity's paradisiac glory. Only the salutary subordination of woman, of course, for Ambrose, woman to man, and of both to the authority of Christ could redeem the situation and restore the communion and communication lost in and with paradise. Augustine sets in relief the devolution of divine human communication with Eve's 
strategic role therein. The man created first received God's direct commandment. Then the woman received it indirectly through the man, whom God still indicted first, even though the sin had actually arisen from the woman's being cleverly deceived by the devil when he capitalized on Eve's own latent hubris. The Aristotelian recognition or anagnorisis appears then in the protoplasts having their eyes opened in Genesis 3 verse 7, signaling their newfound interior shame of conscience and the exterior shame of an exposed prurient desire. The lesser known Gallican bishop Avitus of Vienne around the turn of the 6th century pressed even further than Ambrose and Augustine in enhancing the tragic features of the fall in his very long Latin poem entitled On Original Sin. The poem treats Satan, Adam, Eve, and the Creator as tragedies, as characters in a tragedy that is spiraling disastrous, disastrously downward. And Avesus takes generous artistic liberties by crafting and inserting long rhetorical declamations delivered by each character which explore the deeper psychology of sin and amplify the dramatic intrigue and irony of the narrative. Satan is not just a deceiver, but himself a fallen and tragic figure, though he is also still a masterful rhetorician. Eve is not just a naive woman, but claims to Adam that the serpent has bequeathed on her a new wisdom. Adam shirks his own necessary role in the fall and cries foul when his wife is all to blame, that his, that his wife is all to blame. But in the end, the creator issues his condemnations and the human posterity is left in creation like, stra like a stranger in a strange land with a cosmic reversal of fortune sealed behind them. Meanwhile, amid the characters' respective speeches, Avitus interjects his own commentary, assuming the role of a tragic chorus in shedding light on the unfolding catastrophe, Satan's final speech is worth quotation. He claims victory at the end. Quote, Behold, the godlike glory of the praise I promised abides in you. Whatever knowledge was within my grasp, trust now it is yours. I have shown you everything, have guided your senses through what was hidden, and whatever evil ingenious nature had denied to you, this I have taught, allowing man to join left and right foul and fitting. Nor does God, although he formed you earlier, have greater rights on you. Let him hold what he himself made, what I taught is mine, and the greater portion remains with me. You owe much to your creator, but much more to your teacher. Unquote. It is Augustine, however, who spelled out in substantial theological detail the vision of the fall as a tragedy which he dramatized all the more by integrating the revamped image of himself as a tragic self in the Confessions. For there he accounts not only for his soul's metaphysical status, its deviation from the glory of the intelligible realm, but also in stark contrast with Neoplatonism, his soul's hereditary link to Adam and its embroilment in the tragic historical contingencies affecting fallen humanity. Augustine intimates that he and his fellow tragic selves have been thwarted from re returning expeditiously to the divine bosom or recovering the prelapsarian paradise from which Adam and Eve were cast as a consequence of the primeval reversal of fortune they have all inherited the insidious, tragic flaw of original sin. The ingrained powerlessness of the, good to, of the soul to will the good, much less to do it, along with a deep disorientation of the soul's root desire. Sin has become like an infection of the human race with unbridled lust, concupiscence, as its virus-like carrier. Such that as Augustine makes clear in his anti-Pelagian treatises, even the most disciplined asceticism cannot reverse the contagion or provide the vaccine. Francesca Murphy argues convincingly, I think, that the peculiarly tragic dimension of original sin for origin, or excuse me, for Augustine, is that there really is no ready explanation for it, no patented theodicy to make sense of why God allowed the fall to happen in the first place. 
The primordial lapse of Satan, the angels, and Adam and Eve simply happened and it has caught up Adam's posterity in the net of its disastrous repercussions. In my view, Augustine heightens the tragic intensity of the fall precisely by proposing that the human self's freedom is not lost, but horribly stunted. Its ability not to sin, the famous passa non peccare, forfeited, such that the self languages, languishes not just under the inevitability, but also the inner necessitas of sin, a suffocating false freedom which can be countermanded solely by God's own freedom to intervene. When the Pelagian Celestius disputes the possibility of sin being an unavoidable necessity, Augustine turns to the authority of the psalmist's own plea in Psalm 24, 17, 25, 17 in the Hebrew text, lead me out of my necessity. And yet it is precisely the ostensive tragic senselessness of the fall, the seeming fatefulness of the legacy of original sin that enables Augustine also in the boldest relief to set the wondrousness of the grace of God, the grace that intervenes to deliver the faithful. The tragedy of all is sharply contrasted with the gratuity of the God who is providing a way forward for Augustine and his other tragic selves, for them to be redeemed and recreated. On this point, Augustine tracks simultaneously in the interpretive trajectory of the fall and in the, the, the trajectory of the fall as an apocalypse, since in the end, the sheer graciousness of the creator is all that can, sense, all that can make sense of the embattled uh, history of the human race. Indeed, in the Confessions, Book 12, Augustine makes clear that his own sinful soul distended through time, his selfhood fragmented between past, present, and future, has no hope whatsoever apart from the reintegrating power of the Creator. So let me conclude very quickly. Patristic interpreters of the fall approach Genesis 3 as part of the whole primeval history, which they perceived to have a narrative thickness unlike anything else found within the Hebrew Scriptures. And indeed, Genesis 1 through 3 garnered a disproportionate amount of patristic commentary, both on its own mer merits and because of its resonances through the rest of the Bible. For Augustine's self-described de literal interpretation, which he undertook in no less than three commentaries, that comes across more as a, that, that interpretive process comes more, more across as a, a, a heuristic, exploratory kind of exercise, searching after multiple legitimate meanings. Such doubtless, of course, will not satisfy Klaus Westermann or many other modern critics of Genesis, anxious to render the primeval history even more transparent to ancient Near Eastern religious culture. But what Augustine describes is largely the same approach that motivated many early Christian expositors who could allow various trajectories of interpretation of creation and the fall to develop side by side and sometimes even to overlap. The three trajectories that I've mentioned here are not necessarily exhaustive, but they are representative. And within each one, there was considerable latitude and a, a lot of moral and doctrinal issues in play. The patience of early Christian expositors for multiple and multi-layered interpretations was but a function of their conviction that hermeneutics is a pretty intensely contemplative and theological exercise from beginning to end. Even where the exegetical issue is grammatical or literary and not just something explicitly inviting doctrinal reflection. All the while, most patristic exegetes could agree with Origen that the living logos, the living divine word of God, pervades the biblical texts and demands diligence. And that even the difficulties, the scandala, as Origen calls them in the text, have been divinely imposed there to prod lazy readers. Dare I say that Origen and Klaus Westermann, from their very different scholarly context, might well have accused each other of precisely uninterpretive laziness. Thanks.